The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. He replied to him, Friend, who appointed me as your judge and arbitrator? Then he said to the crowd, Take care to guard against all greed, for though one may be rich, one's life does not consist of possessions. Then he told them a parable. There was a rich man whose land produced a bountiful harvest. He asked himself, What shall I do? For I do not have space to store my harvest. And he said, This is what I shall do. I shall tear down my barns and build larger ones. There I shall store all my grain and other goods, and I shall say to myself, Now, as for you, you have so many good things stored up for many years. Rest, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this night your life will be demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, to whom will they belong? Thus will it be for all who store up treasure for themselves, but are not rich in what matters to God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. If you knew that you had only one week left on this earth, that next week at this time you would not be here at the 9.30 Mass because God would have called you home, how would you fill this week? What would you do with these last mm, six and a half days? How would you spend them? What would you want to accomplish? There was once a very, very rich man who, becoming aware that he was nearing the end of his life, decided he had a whole problem with this you-can't-take-it-with-you idea. So he hired an attorney and sued heaven over it. And of course, heaven doesn't worry about lawsuits, but St. Peter thought, oh, we'll humor the guy. And they settled with him, agreeing to let him bring one suitcase with him when he came to heaven. Well, sure enough, when the guy passed, he thought he could outsmart St. Peter and came with a suitcase that measured eight foot long, six foot wide, and five foot deep. And he showed up at the pearly gates dragging that thing. And Peter said, that's not a suitcase. And the guy said, da -da 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 -da. our settlement said nothing about the size of the suitcase. And Peter said, okay, fine, but I still have to check it out. I still have to see what you're bringing with you. The man said, please, please go right ahead. So Peter opened up the suitcase, and there it was, packed from side to side, top to bottom, with hundreds and hundreds of pure gold bars. And Peter looked at the man and said, really? You could bring anything you wanted with you, and you brought pavement? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Vanity of vanities, says Koheleth in our first reading today. Vanity of vanities, and actually, for having been written thousands and thousands of years ago, he really sounds like he's speaking to so many people in our society today when he says, what good does it do you? You work hard, and you work wisely, and you work anxiously. You don't even sleep at night. Your brain is so busy, and then you die, and it all goes to someone else. Vanity of vanities. Like I say, kind of talking right to a lot of us. As I think if we're honest and with honest eyes look at our society and our culture as a whole, we, we have to fess up that the economy is at the center of everything and that we are a society that is overtly and overly consumeristic. We like possessions. We like to buy things. And the newer, the bigger, the brighter, the better. In a way, I think shopping malls have sort of become churches for many people. 
places where they go with their hopes, with their needs, with their desires, with their dreams, and they try to find some sense of fulfillment and some sense of happiness out of what they can get and what they can hang on to. Uh, credit cards have become kind of a new form of grace, if you will, allowing people to obtain things that otherwise they would never, ever be able to get. And I'll admit, mass advertising is perhaps one of the most prominent and powerful preaching methods the world has ever seen. And oh, are we persuaded by it. Oh, are we persuaded by it. If you have any doubts, watch how many people leave their Thanksgiving tables, leave their family and their friends so they can go pitch tents in front of Best Buy and get in there on Black Friday. Lots of stuff for little money. I want it. We need lots of it. We are great consumers. Um, and as I shared with you a couple weeks ago, just in passing, we sometimes fail to recognize that our society is now set up in such a way that it needs you to be a consumer. Despite the promises of advertising to fulfill you and bring you happiness, make everything well, if that actually happened, it would be disastrous for us. I mean, if you actually decided that right now in your life, you have enough stuff, you're good enough, you do enough, you're all good, that would be a disaster for our economy. What would happen if when the iPhone 7 came out, everybody in the nation said, don't need it, I got the 6? What would that do to Apple? Oh my word, everything would go into a tailspin around the globe if we all decided I'm good with a 6 and don't need a 7. If we don't have to upgrade our life, the economy runs into problems. Now just to be clear, owning stuff is not a great spiritual crime, and no great spiritual cry. I think Jesus knows that stuff and money is important. I mean, we need money to provide shelter and homes and food and clothing for our families. So that's not really the issue. Uh, the real question becomes, how much importance do you place on the stuff, on the possessions, on the wealth? Because the real problem becomes that for many people, either deliberately or not deliberately, reflectively or not reflectively, the stuff, the, the wealth, the possessions become where people start to look for a sense of their self-esteem, for a sense of their self-worth, for a sense of how successful they are in the world. We begin to look at that stuff as being the stuff that's going to bring us fulfillment, that's going to give us control over our life if we have enough, and that's going to bring us happiness. And we know from lived experience that's not how it works. I've shared with you before my own take on that because I find myself falling victim to that illusion with some regularity. You know how it goes. You go, oh, I like that. If I had that, I'd be happy. Things would be great. And so either you whip out the credit card or the debit card or you do your work and you save and you're getting ready all with your goal in mind and then you get it. It's mine now. <laughs> and I'm happy and this is wonderful and it's really marvelous. And then, oh, what's that? <laughs> well, if I could just, you know how that goes. It's never ending. It's never ending. And that becomes a problem. That's an illusion for us that stuff, possessions, can fulfill us, give our life meaning, our self-worth, and give us control. As interesting as the parable is that Jesus tells us today, I'm kind of going to stare away from it. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in it, mind you. There's the fact that this guy in the parable, we could look at how often he says, I, 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 my, my, my. He sort of forgets about everybody else in his life. Or, and I find this fascinating, this is the only parable, the one we've heard today is the only parable in all the Gospels where God himself shows up as a character, where God says something, warning the guy that you don't have control over your own life, even though you think you may. What I want to spend just a moment with you is on what leads up to the parable. Where a guy comes to Jesus and wants him to get involved in a family dispute about the finances and the inheritance. And Jesus 
refuses to do that. No, 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 no. And he warns people, be on guard against greed in all its forms. So even if you're rich, life does not consist in possessions. Even if you're rich, your life does not consist of possessions. See, the Galilean carpenter today, I think, is really down to earth in what he's talking about. Because his teaching that he tries to provide is not about how to get into heaven and how to avoid hell. His teaching today is about how to have a fulfilling life and a happy life right here, right now on this earth. Yes, believe it or not, he's interested in you having a fulfilling life right here on earth. So he tries to say to people, your life is not about, life does not consist of possessions. And by the end of the parable, he says, do what matters to God. You want to grow rich, if you will, in what matters to God. And what matters to God? Well, I think the author to the Colossians gives us a hint today when he says, brothers and sisters, if you were raised with Christ, seek what is above. Seek what is above. Get your mind set on God. So what is that? What, what is it that's going to bring us fulfillment, happiness, that's not passing, that's not temporary? What is above? You know the answer to that. You know the answer to that. Back to the original question. If you had only one week left to live, how would you fill that time? What would you do? My guess is that there'd be a line outside my door for confession, <laughs> but that also, you would probably spend a lot of that time contacting people, family, and friends, to say things to them like, I'm sorry, or I forgive you, or I love you, or maybe all three of those. Because when everything else gets peeled away, we know that it's always relationships. Our relationship with God and our relationship with others that gives our life real meaning and real purpose and brings us real happiness. Why wait till your last week to do that? And to tell you honestly, the state that the world is in right now needs people who are willing to say, I forgive you, I'm sorry, and I love you. Tanks and bombers and policies and politicians may be able to beat back evil, but darkness will only be defeated when everyday regular folk like you and I aren't afraid to live the gospel and say, I love you. I forgive you, I'm sorry. If we take care of now what is really important, then I think we'll be set both here and in the hereafter. 